five hundred eighty seven will do the first second and fourth verses not much change in the announcements from this morning might remember that this is a fifth Sunday month so next month or next week is the uh, fifth Sunday uh, we did get a couple of new printers in and those are set up in both offices one in each office and those are working so um, if anybody needs to use those printers those are up and running and ready to go so. all right 587 Tis so sweet to trust in Jesus, just to take him at his word, just to rest upon his promise, just to know the saith the Lord. Jesus, Jesus, how I trust him, how I prove him more and more. Jesus, Jesus, precious Jesus, oh, for grace to trust him more. Oh, how sweet to trust in Jesus, just to trust his cleansing blood, just in simple faith to plunge me neath the healing cleansing flood. Jesus, Jesus, how I trust him, how I proved him more and more. Jesus, Jesus, precious Jesus, oh, for grace to trust him more. I'm so glad I learned to trust the precious Jesus, Savior, friend, and I know that thou art with me, wilt be with me to the end. Jesus, Jesus, how I trust him, how I proved him more and more. Jesus, Jesus, precious Jesus, oh, for grace to trust him more. 589, right across the page, 589 before our opening prayer, which will be led by Brother Earl. To Christ be loyal and be true, his banner be unfurled, and born along till his secured the conquest of the world. To Christ the Lord be true, for he will go Let's 
Father in heaven, again, we're thankful for the day that you've given us and the blessings of this life. And we pray that as we quiet our minds and bow before you in our hearts and our spirits, that we will offer up the praise and worship that you would have us to offer in the way that you'd have us to do it. We pray that if there's any sin to our account, that you'll forgive us of those things as we turn from them. Be with us this evening as we come together and join in our worship towards you and offer praise and we pray that the things we hear tonight will take to our hearts and meditate upon them. We pray that you'll be with those that are sick and afflicted and not able to be with us if it be your will. Please restore them to their health and to our number. We pray for those that are wayward and not here because their hearts are not right that they will repent before it is too late. Father, we pray for all of those that are struggling to serve you in this world, knowing that the only hope of heaven is to keep following you day by day. Continue to lift up the hands of those men that are preaching your word around the world, that they'll continue to preach without addition or without subtraction, simply preach what you've revealed. We pray, Father, your continued blessings on us, your providential care to lead us from temptation, to Keep us safe in this world if it be possible. Help us, Father, to have the courage, though, to face whatever the world will send our way, knowing that one day we'll stand before you and be approved if we remain faithful. All these things we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. If you'd like to go ahead and mark your songbooks, the Song of Invitation is going to be 696. 696 will be the song of invitation tonight. And then the next song is going to be 474. <clears throat> 474 will be the next song. <clears throat> sing to me of heaven, sing that song of peace. From the toils that find me it will bring release. Burdens will be lifted that are pressing so. Showers of great blessing for my heart will flow. Sing to me of heaven, let me fondly dream of its golden glory, of its pearly gleam. Sing to me when shadows of the evening fall. Sing to me of heaven, sweetest song of all. Sing to me of heaven as I walk alone, dreaming of the comrades that so long have gone. In a fairer region among the angel throng, they are happy as they sing that old sweet song. Sing to me of heaven, let me fondly dream of its golden glory, of its pearly gleam. Sing to me when shadows of the evening fall. Sing to me of heaven, sweetest song of all. Sing to me of heaven tenderly and low, till the shadows only rise and swiftly go. When my heart is weary, when the day is long, sing to me of heaven, sing that old sweet song. Sing to me of heaven, let me fondly dream of its golden glory, of its pearly gleam. Sing to me when shadows of the Sing to me of heaven, sweetest song.
song of old. Next song is 475, right across the page. We'll sing the first, second, and fourth verses of 475. Then Brother Luke will bring the scripture reading, and Brother Charlie will bring the lesson. <clears throat> My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly lean on Jesus' name. On Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand, all other ground is sinking sand. When darkness veils his lovely face, I rest on his unchanging grace. Every high and stormy gale, my anchor holds within the veil. On Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand. All other ground is sinking sand. When he shall come with trumpet sound, oh, may I then in Righteousness alone, faultless to stand before the throne. On Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand. All other ground is sinking sand. reading will be from the book of Exodus, chapter 31, verse 18. Exodus 31, 18. <clears throat> and he gave unto Moses, when he had made an end of communing with him upon Mount Sinai, two tables of testimony, tables of stone, written with the finger of God. Now, Brother Charlie with a message. Good evening. I'd like to welcome everyone here and all everybody that's, are we on the internet? Okay. And anybody out there in the metaverse or whatever they call it nowadays? Um, there's a story about a Jewish man and a Christian man, and they were arguing. The Jewish man said, you Christians stole the Ten Commandments from us. And the Christian said, we may have taken them from you, but we didn't keep them. That's humor for you. Anyways, Ten Commandments. Written by the finger of God in stone. Did he ever write anything else with his finger in stone? Think of the significance and importance of that. We know during, I believe it's great, uh, Nebuchadnezzar's grandson, Belshazzar, or whatever, he uh, wrote upon the wall up there that, you know, he was weighed in the balance found lacking, but we have no place in the Bible where it says that Christ wrote anything with his down for us to keep in any form, but God here writes it in, the t in stone. No other thing's ever quite done this way. And, and I think we underestimate the value of the Ten Commandments. You know, it used to be every courthouse, there were most courthouses that have the Ten Commandments up there, all kinds of places. It's probably Moses and then the Ten Commandments were the probably of, in the general population are probably the most well-known thing in the Old Testament. Jesus Christ is probably the most well-known thing in the New Testament. I would say that uh, probably in the general population that Moses' name is more familiar to people than any other name other than Jesus. And the Ten Commandments, everyone has heard about them. Uh, they say the law was nailed to the cross. I'm going to tell you I believe the ceremonial law 
and the legal laws were nailed to the cross and left behind. But I believe what we see, other than the, our type of worship to God, that not all nine of those Ten Commandments are still in effect, and they're still very valuable. And I think we overlook the value in the Ten Commandments, and that goes for the entire Old Testament. Years ago, when I bought a Dixon, looking for bought my first Dixon Bible, they're a very good Bible out of print now. I was in uh, Arkansas in a, a store, and a lady running it. She's a Baptist, very nice Baptist lady. And I said, "Well, what kind of Bible do Church of Christ members buy?" And she said, "Generally, they just buy a New Testament. That kind of a standard procedure used to be, and I maybe still is in most churches. Many churches, they just don't. They say." We're not under the old law. There's tremendous value in the Old Testament to be had. And I'm going to deal with that in a little bit here because uh, uh, I believe there's a whole lot of value. And those Ten Commandments, they are a great way to live your life. Ten Commandments are actually central to the New Testament. Much of what we see, the Christ and the apostles' teaching, are those Ten Commandments. Uh, Christ and his apostles, they kept the law. You know, uh, Christ, he kept it perfectly. Not one error, not one slip in the law. I want to go look at how... Uh, some of the verses that indicate that many of those new, the Ten Commandments were basically still in effect after Christ was dead by the words of the apostles. Let's go to Romans 3. Oh, by the way, I'm going to do a little couple of sidebars here. You know, they uh, talk about how preachers sometimes go off on a coon hunt, you know, or something off of the edge. Well, I'm going to do that, but that's purposely I'm doing it because I ran across things I'd like to mention in this. So, we'll, But we'll get back to the main, the Ten Commandments. Let's go to Romans 3. Now, in Romans 3, Paul here is talking about the importance of faith. Now, we're going to get into something here. Uh, let's just go on a minute. Romans 3, and this whole chapter is dealing with faith. Let's go to verses 24 and 25. It says... Being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, in whom God set forth to be a propitiation, propitiation through faith in his blood to declare his righteousness and remission of sins that are passed through the overbearance of God. I shouldn't have read that. I had that marked off. Let's scratch that and go to 331. This is where Paul said, Do we make void the law through faith? God forbid. Yea, we establish the law. The first point I want to talk about is what law is he talking about here? He's talking about the Old Testament law. Most of that. And I'm talk, not talking about the ceremonial law that was relating to the Jews. We have to separate the law here to get, understand where I'm going. There's the ceremonial and legal laws. By legal, I mean the death penalty for this, cut off an arm for that, that kind of thing, and the moral laws, which the Ten Commandments are the moral laws. We need to separate because that, that law, the Old Testament, the Ten Commandments are still, I believe, in effect other than our mode of worship has changed. Paul here, when he talks about do we make void the law through faith, God forbid, yea, we establish the law. People who read the book of Romans come away with the idea that we are saved by faith alone. No, Paul clearly states right here that we are not saved by faith alone. Faith is very important, but it does not make the law void. The idea is he's dealing in the book of Romans with faith. When you go to the book of James, he deals with work. Works, but he also says you've got to have faith and works. So that's one thing I want to clarify. They try to use this section of Romans in Romans in here to say faith only is all that's required. No, the law is required. You've got to have the faith and the works obey the law. 
Let's go to Romans 6, 1 and 2. What shall we say? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid. How thee, we that are dead to sin, live any longer. He's talking about continuing in sin. When you continue in sin, you make the law void. You, what, that's what sin is, where you transgression of the law. And I think the law he's talking about there again is the law of Moses. Romans seven twelve. The moral law that has been in effect not only the law of Moses, not the law of Moses, the Ten Commandments and other laws. Romans seven twelve. The apostle says, Wherefore the law is holy, and the commandment holy and good, just and good. He's talking about the Old Testament Ten Commandments in through there, the law. Do you really think God made any bad laws? Stop and think about it a minute. He made a specific set of laws for the Jewish people to raise a Messiah out of with these ceremonial laws and legal system and all that that describes exact punishment. When we move into the Christian era, he's bringing in all nations. Those more, the laws of morality are still going on there, the Ten Commandments, but the methods of punishment and the ceremonial things are all gone. And that's partly because he's bringing in so many buried in different peoples. Romans 2.13. Let's go to Acts. Yeah, Romans 2.13. For not the hearers of the law are just before God, but the doers of the law shall be justified. What law is he talking about there? I think he's talking about the Ten Commandments and those laws of morality we see in the Old Testament, and we see them in the patriarchal ages. But they're, they're most, they've come out so well in the Ten Commandments, those moral laws. Let's go to 1 Corinthians seven nineteen. Circumcision is nothing, and uncircumcision is nothing, but the keeping of the commands of God. I believe he's going back there. He's telling those ceremonial laws are nothing anymore, such as circumcision, but keeping the commandments of God. He's talking about all those commandments God made back there, the, the Ten Commandments and other places, especially the Ten Commandments, I believe. Let's go to Acts 24, 14. Acts 24, 14. But this I confess unto thee, that after the way which they call a sect, so worship I the God of my fathers, believing in all things which are written in the law and the prophets. I believe there he's talking about those Ten Commandments and the other Old Testament laws of morality that we should accept. Not the ceremonial laws, I'm going to tell you there. Let's go to Hebrews 8, 6, and 10. Hebrews chapter 6, verses 8 and 10. But that which bear... Let me see if I looked at that right. Yeah, it's Hebrews 8, 6 and 10. But now he has obtained a more excellent ministry by how much also he is a mediator of a better covenant which is established upon better promises. For if the first covenant had not had been faultless, then should no place have been sought for a second. But finding fault with them, he saith, Behold the day come, and that with them, that means with the people. He saith, Behold the day come, saith the Lord, well I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. Not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day when I took them out of the hand by the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt, because they continued not in my covenant, and I regarded them not, saith the Lord. For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, saith the Lord. I will put my hearts into their mind, my, my laws into their mind, and write them in their hearts, 
and I will be to them a God, and they shall be to me a people. He's not making new laws. He's making a new covenant. No new, not new law, new covenant. Christ, uh, in Matthew 5, 17 through 19, he expanded the law. Let's go there, Matthew 5, 17 through 19. Think not that I have come to destroy the law or the prophets, but I have, I am not come to destroy, but to fulfill. For verily I say unto you, till heaven and earth pass away, one iota or one little, or one tittle shall not in no ways pass from the law till all be fulfilled. Now he's talking about the prophecies concerning him, but I believe he's talking about the whole law. And if you go on down a little further there, where he, let me look here. On down to about verse uh, 33, even before the, uh, let's go on the rest of the chapter there. Start, let's say verse 27 on. What he's going to talk about through the rest of that chapter is he puts these laws that he's expanding upon. He makes them tougher. He goes in 27 talking about thou shalt not, not commit adultery. He takes that law and toughens it up. He said, if you have it in your heart, you've committed it, even without the physical actions. In verse 31, he said, who shall not put, a, let him get, uh, he's talking about divorce. But then he goes on and says, hey, divorce for no other reason than infidelity. And some other things, many other things that go through the rest of the chapter. I'm not going to deal with them. But he takes that old law and he expounds it and toughens it up. He expands it. I want to throw in one chat section here about, um, let's go to Mark 10, verses 17 through 22. This is not exactly fitting in exactly, but it's a great story. <sighs> Mark 10, 17 through 22. This is a story about a rich young man that comes to him and, uh, he talks to Jesus what he should do to inherit eternal life. And uh, 18, Jesus said to him, Why callest thou me good? There is none but one that is good, but one that is God. Thou knowest the commandments. Do not commit adultery. Do not kill. Do not steal. Do not bear false witness. Do not defraud not. Honor thy father and mother. That's basically the Ten Commandments there. And he answered and said to him, I have observed all these from my youth. And then Jesus says, You lack one thing. Go thy way, sell, and whatever thou hast, and give to the poor. Thou shalt have tre treasure in heaven, and come up and take the cross. And the man was sad and saying, and went away grieved, for he had great possessions. Do you know which one of those commandments, ten commandments, he was guilty of? Covetousness. He had not fulfilled all the commandments. He missed out on covetousness because he, he was greedy for his possessions. You know what? So what happens today? The reasoning of men stop us from fulfilling God's laws. Isaiah said, come let us reason together. That can be abused. You can justify, and I've said this before, you can justify any behavior you want if you want to reason long enough about it. I gamble just because it's entertainment. I can afford it. Anything you want to, anything you can justify in your mind if you want to reason about it long enough. Now I want to get, go to Romans uh, 8, verses 28 through 30. This is another one of my wandering deals here, I think. Ten Commandments are very important.
And we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them that are called according to his purpose. For whom he did foreknow, he also did predestine to be conformed to the image of his Son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Now, when they talk about predestination, I've always said, the character of the man to be saved is predestined from the very beginning, but not the identity of the individual. God predestined that character from the very beginning, from the patriarchal period. They knew what was right and wrong. God told them part of it, and they knew the other part by instinct. The Ten Commandments reiterated the man that would be served that followed those. Christ did too. Predestined. He said he predestined from the beginning. I believe that the same man who was saved in the patriarchal age would be saved in the Mosaic period and would be saved in the Christian era. That's how he was predestined. A man with the kind of heart that had the same heart in the patriarchal period, the Mosaic period, and the Christian era would be saved, the same man, because he's just serving God and his commandments. His character would be the same. We should always obey God's command. They're good for us. They give us abundant life. Plus, they're his laws. I want to go look at the Ten Commandments for a moment here. We're going to go to Exodus 22. I want to say, I, I kind of got to think about these Ten Commandments. You know, considering everybody knows about the Ten Commandments, if you're going to work and study with someone, that might be a pretty good place to start because they have some familiarity with at least a term, if nothing else, the Ten Commandments. What did I say? Exodus 20. I think it's Exodus 20. 20 I was going for. Exodus 20, verse 1. And God spoke all these words, saying, I am the Lord thy God, which have brought thee out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. That's the first commandment. Actually, the first four commandments deal with our relationship with God. That is still in effect today. Verse 4, Thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is under the earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. Thou shalt not bow thou thyself down to them nor to serve them. For I, the Lord, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children of the third and fourth generation of them that love me and keep my commandments. That's the second commandment, still in effect today. Verse 7, Thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain, for the Lord will not hold him guiltless that taketh his name in vain. That's the third commandment, still in effect today. Verse 8, Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days shall thy labor and do all thy works, but the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord thy God. For in it thou shalt not do any work, thou nor thy son nor thy daughter, thy manservant, nor thy maidservant, nor the gattle, nor the stranger that is within thy gates. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea, and all that is in them, and rested on the seventh day. Wherefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. That's the fourth commandment in our relationship with God. That is done differently now. That one is crossed out, but we still have an obligation there. We come together on the first day of the week. We uh, teach and preach the gospel. I think that teach, takes the place of that Sabbath day as a, one of our duties to God. It's a different duty. It's done differently, but it, we have a, an established day that we do that on. And that's on the su Sundays. We come together, and we can come together other times. And we shouldn't uh, abandon the assembling together when we get come together at other times. 
Fifth commandments in verse 12. Honor thy father and thy mother that thy days may be long upon the land which the Lord thy God giveth thee. That is included also today. Verse 13. And I want to tell you, honor thy father and mother. That's always been a very difficult thing for many people because if you have a parent who's really bad and not nice and not very good, what does honor mean? How can you give honor to someone? I mean, Stalin had children. Should they have honored him? Think what he's talking about there by honoring is providing for them. When they get old and broken down and can't work, you need to at least provide shelter and food and at least some kind of clothing for them. You're not giving them glory and honor. It's honor is a provision. And if you go look at Corbin, where they talk about that in the New Testament, C-O-R-B-A, and you'll see where the uh, Jews were neglectful in doing that, taking care of their old people. But I believe that honors what it's talking about there. Because it makes no sense that you could honor a wicked person that with the type of honor we think of. Honor there, I believe, what he's referring is caring for them. Because they did raise you. Maybe not very good, but they raised you. Verse 13, thou shalt not kill. That's never changed. Verse 14, thou shalt not commit adultery. Same today. Verse 15, thou shalt not steal. That's the Eighth Commandment. Still today. Thou shalt not bear false witness against thy neighbor. That's 16, the ninth commandment. The tenth commandment, thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's house. Thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's wife, nor his manservant, nor his maidservant, nor his ox, nor his ass, nor anything that is thy neighbor's. I want you to look at those verses, those commandments, just from verse 12 through 17, honor your father and mother, do not kill, do not commit adultery, do not steal, do not bear false witness or lie, and do not covet thy neighbor's properties. You know, if we lived in a society that kept those six commandments, I don't know that we'd need very much more. He goes into much later in the other in the other books of the Torah about punishments specifically detailing for each one of these things for certain types of adultery for certain types of false witness for certain types of stealing the punishment will vary but if everyone followed verses 12 through 17 we would have a pretty good world out there very good in fact Ten Commandments are very important still to us today I'm going to hit a couple of quick top things here, just maybe related, maybe not. Many live in denial of God and his word because they want to continue in sin. People like their sin. It's the pleasures for a season. That's many one of the major reasons, I believe, why God, people do not want to accept God. The Bible definition of freedom is not doing whatever you want. Freedom is enjoying the benefits of doing what we should do. Amazing the number of laws in this world. I was read, looking up some numbers. These go back to 2010. There were 20,000 gun laws in the United States alone on the books. Just relating to gun laws, 20,000. In 2008, I read to the House Committee asked the Congressional Research Center to calculate the number of criminal offenses in federal laws. Five years later, that committee came back and said, we don't have the manpower or the resources to do that. The Ten Commandments basically cover everything, all laws. There's not much in there left without, without that. I mean, some of them you have to get into more depth. Where you see about co the uh, thou shalt not commit adultery, that's a generalization there. He gets into more detail later on. He tells about homosexuality and the penalties for that. Adult, there's a man and there's a woman. That's the way God created them. He didn't create someone who didn't know what they were, like we have today, or somebody who wants to change who they are. He created a man and woman, and there's only one intimate relationship, and that is between a man and a woman, period. 
Like I said, that's kind of a generalization of that, but that's what it means. That covers everything. You know, there was a time in the Bible, I believe it's during the Judges, roughly, where a man did whatever is right in his own mind or his own eyes. Uh, every society does that. You know, there was a time when, uh, turn on the TV and look at the language that's used. It used to be those kind of word, swear words and obscene words were not tolerated in our society. But they no longer scandalize us. They no longer bother us, general society. But society always has a moral code, and we have one today. There are certain statements, certain things we cannot talk about without being ostracized from society. If you want to criticize, go on the Internet and criticize transgenderism, homosexuality, certain political aspects. Use certain terms you shouldn't use, and you will be ostracized and beat to death. Although we have a moral standard today, but it's not a very good one. It's a corrupt, wicked one. I just threw that in. That's an extra you get for nothing segment. But it's true. We have a moral standard, and it's corrupt in this country. But we can hope and pray that it'll change. And if it doesn't, we can still keep ourselves on the straight and narrow. Life is as a vapor. I remember when Renata was a little bitty kid about that big. And I hate to tell you, Renata, but you're on the far end down there. <laughs> it come, goes quick. And I am too. But it goes quick. It's a vapor. We should look for something more substantial, something much longer. It isn't built into man to die. He does not want to die. And there's a reason for that, because God instills something in us that we look for eternity. The lesson is yours. Ten Commandments, I think, are very important. The Old Testament's very important because if you can't find how God thought about something in the uh, New Testament, you can, if you find it in the Old Testament and he didn't like it, you can pretty well bet that it's not. he still doesn't like it. Malachi tells us that God's the same today, yesterday, and, to, yesterday, today, and tomorrow. He hadn't changed any. He isn't going to change. God doesn't change his laws or his ways to satisfy man. Man has to change his ways. If you'd like to become a Christian, you may have some things to change in your life, but that can be done. It's fairly easy. Or if you've got Christians who've gone astray or you've got some problems or something you need to address or ask for prayers or something, come forward as we sing this next song. Thank you.
Supper has been left prepared. You can make your way forward as we sing the first verse of 370. 370. song is 584. 584. We'll sing the first, second, and fifth verse, and after this song, we'll ask Brother Steve to lead us in a word of prayer. First, second, and fifth. To Canaan's land I'm on my way where the soul never dies. My darkest night will turn to day where the soul ever dies. No sad farewells, no tear dimmed eyes, where all is love and the soul never dies. A rose is Father in heaven, we're so thankful for this hour that we have to study thy word and to worship you. We pray that we will take this good lesson to heart and take it with us after we leave this building and practice it through the week, that it will help us to grow our strength and our faith in you, that we're able to go among this cruel world knowing that you're always with us and that you have given us the word to be able to defend ourselves and to stay true to you we pray that you'll be with those that couldn't be here this evening pray that they will return to us at the next appointed time we pray that we have been edified through your word and through fellowship that that we will be a shining light to you, to the rest of the world as we leave this building. We thank you for our Lord and Savior Jesus, your only begotten Son. 
And we know if he hadn't have given himself up to the cross, then we would still be in, our faith would be in vain and our hope for eternity would be gone. We pray that you'll forgive us when we fall short. Give us the strength and the wisdom to resist temptation. For it's in his name that we pray. Amen. One more point. Those handouts you got, uh, I don't, I'm not, I haven't looked those over to see if they